Welcome back to the fourth and final part of our podcast series on the Italian resistance. If you haven't listened to the previous parts yet, then I suggest you go back and listen to those first. Alla mattina Appena alzata Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao alla mattina Before we get started, just a quick reminder that our podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Our supporters fund our work and in return get exclusive early access and ad-free podcast episodes, bonus episodes, free and discounted merch and other content. For example, our Patreon supporters have access to three bonus episodes for this series, covering post-war Italian anti-fascism, as well as discussions about films and music of the Italian resistance. Join us or find out more at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory, link in the show notes. To help us raise funds for our work, we've also produced a range of merch commemorating the Italian resistance and our theme tune, Bella Ciao. And as a listener to the podcast, you get a 10% discount off that and other items in our online shop using the discount code WCHPODCAST. Link in the show notes. At the end of the last episode, we spoke about how the Togliatti amnesty meant that many fascist war criminals were pardoned, while anti-fascist partisans were subject to harassment. Given this, it's no surprise that many former partisans turned to other means to exact justice. We hear a lot about the Triangolo Rosso, the Red Triangle, the revenges of partisans against the fascists after the war, the books by Panza. This happened in certain areas of Italy, especially in Emilia-Romagna, where peasant workers were exploited like Africans are exploited today in the south of Italy. The partisans used the resistance and even the years after to have the revenge, especially on landowners who were close to fascism. The books by Panza that Alfredo mentions are those by Giampaolo Panza, a journalist who wrote a lot of revisionist histories about the resistance, which we'll discuss later on in the episode. Meanwhile, the Red Triangle that he mentions was an area in the Emilia-Romagna region where a lot of post-war reprisals against fascists took place, and is sometimes also referred to as the Triangle of Death. The Triangle of Death, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's used a lot, but not... Um, how, can, how can I say it? Uh, it's used a lot by fascists. In a way, they used to say to say, yeah, you see, they, they were violent, they were scums, they were criminals, they kept killing innocent people. Why in that area? Uh, Emilia Romagna is a, it has really a peculiar history. Uh, it is the, the the history where it was quite strong. Uh, the presence not only of the unions, but especially of the you know farmers' unions, small farmers' unions, the Lege Contadine, uh, which were among the first target of. Fascists. I mean, Mussolini was from there. Mussolini was from near Ferrara. So just like 40 kilometers east of the Triangolo della Morte, the Triangle of Death. The huge presence of this kind of organization that remained, I mean, they, they kept, you know, trying to, to do their work even during fascism. And they, and they were first, you know, in the first line when they organized their resistance uh, in 1943, meant that they also suffer from a huge repression. So it is true that you had a lot of killings in that area, uh, but it, it is it is easily relatable to the number of heinous crimes, and I mean heinous not on a juridical point of view, but human. I mean on a human point of view, heinous crime committed by fascists there. There's an example fascist propaganda uses a lot, which is the, the one of the brothers Govoni. The Govoni brothers, two of them, they were fascists. They were you know never they never felt guilty for their acts. They were strong fascists, they were proud of being fascists, they were killed. Some of their other brothers who had nothing to do were killed. It was a crime, yes. It is comparable for or, or what happened on, on that kind of violence which was firstly, you know, um, caused by the fascist violence. That, that, that's, I don't think so. It, it, it is a crime, probably. When innocent people are killed without reason, it's a crime. But you cannot use it to put it on the same level. And this is what is happening in Italy in the last 40 years to make, to put partisans and fascists on the same level. 
A lot of killings did take place in the Red Triangle after the war. But while fascists like Giorgio Pisano, whose conversation with the socialist Vittorio Foa we mentioned in part 3, claim numbers of around 35,000, a fairer number is probably around 8 to 10,000. As Davide explains, the extent of the violence in Emilia Romagna was a response to the fascist violence that went all the way back to the early 1920s and the rise of fascism itself, not to mention the particular intensification of fascist violence as the war was ending. For instance, in the Reggio Emilia area alone, 105 partisans and 65 civilians were killed in the last 10 days before liberation. A number of significant massacres also took place, like the Marzobotto massacre of 1944. The tragedy of Marzabotto, no, the, the Marzabotto killings, which was one of the worst in Italy. There were like 500 people killed in a few days, just like that, and women and children. And it is not fair to say Marzabotto, actually, they prefer to call it tragedy di Montesole because Marzabotto was one, uh, only one of the few towns uh, which is there on Montesole. We're, um, we're south of Bologna on the way to Florence, so it's like 20, 15 minutes today from Bologna. Uh, you, you get into the Apennines, you know, and it's those kind of valleys which get you from Emilia to Tuscany. That, that, that was, you know, the, the perfect environment for partisans. Uh, what happened is that um, in late September uh, 1944, uh, the SS just uh, tried to, to capture the partisans who were, like, were fighting there in Montesole, and they had a good intelligence. They knew they were coming and they just escaped, and they left, you know, women and children behind to see how they will not harm uh, women and children. Well, they did, and it was uh, it was massacre. They they just killed everyone who came up to them. I mean, wiping out all whole villages. Italy. It is important to say when we talk about these crimes, uh, fascists were on their side. They were showing, you know, they're there. You know, that family, the guy probably is a partisan. You have to capture his wife and torture her until she gives you something. So uh, this is another thing that nowadays it's, uh, it's quite common to say in Italy. Oh, yeah, I know, they were Nazis, they were scums, but the fascists in the end, they even tried to protect Italy. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not true. They were the main source of intelligence for Nazi who were responsible for those killings. Post-war anti-fascist violence wasn't limited to Emilia-Romagna. For instance, in Milan, a group of ex-partisans around the Communist Party formed the Volante Rossa, or Red Flying Squad. The Volante Rossa defied the Togliatti amnesty and carried out a number of assassinations until the end of the 40s. We discuss them in more detail in our bonus episode, available exclusively for our Patreon supporters. There were also a number of incidents where frustration among ex-partisans boiled over into open, armed uprisings, such as the one at Casale Monferrato in northwestern Italy in 1947. Casale Monferrato, these, there were those fascists who were responsible to kill, uh, torturing, and execute the member of a partisan group called the Squadra Tom, Banda Tom. They were, you know, they were tortured, their bodies were left hanging in Casale Monferrato in Piedmont for days. These were heinous acts. Still, they were just freed. So anti fascists decided to take matters into their own hands. They found out some of the weapons because, you know, they didn't give the Allies all the weapons after the end of the war, just in case. And they actually used that to take control of towns like, uh, like Casano and Ferrato and uh, to ask, you know, say, we were occupying. So you have two options now. You kick us out with weapons and blood. Uh, of course, that would, would have been an issue, you know. Uh, you know, the Italian army that shoots all the partisans, that, 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 that's a good, you know, thing to start a political crisis. Or you grant us that you will do something about them. The uprising in Casale Monferrato took place alongside a town-wide general strike. Factories, shops, cafes and hotels all closed, their doors barred and shutters pulled down. This armed general strike lasted four days before being called off due to a combination of a large military presence and promises from both the government and the Communist Party. The Communist Party always tried to, uh, in Italy we use a really fun term, which is to, 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 to be a pompiere, a farfata. So to put down fires and the way they say, yeah, yeah, yeah we, we can negotiate. You say, yeah, you know what? You're right. Those people are criminals. We'll put them back in prison. We won't consider them for the amnesty. Uh, we shall give them new charges. Uh, so mostly were lies. Uh, those people, yeah, they were just put in prison to, to make things, you know, calm down. 
Indeed, despite the promises made, the fascists who were convicted for the war crimes committed at Casale Monferrato would later have their execution suspended, then commuted to life in prison, and then, a few years later, were released. The Casale Monferrato rebellion was far from the only armed partisan uprising in this period. However, the biggest rebellion would take place in 1948. It came off the back of an extremely bitter general election earlier that year which saw the Catholic Church mobilise against the left and whose mood was summed up by the right-wing slogan With Christ or Against Christ. Despite repeatedly acting to quell armed actions by former partisans, the Communist Party was frequently subject to frantic accusations of secret plans to stage a coup. And all of this paranoid fantasizing was of course encouraged by millions of dollars pouring into the country via CIA covert operations, which helped sway the elections in the right-wing coalition's favour. It was in this febrile atmosphere then that Communist Party leader Palmiro Togliatti was shot, triggering a widespread revolt of the Italian working class. Togliatti, um, the head of Communist Party of Italy, uh, was shot in July 1948 by this guy Antonio Pallante. Uh, he was, he had a, quite an anti-communist feeling, uh, and um, quite nationalist, even if not fascist. And um, again, he was someone who, who used to think that I don't want to be, you know, a satellite of the Soviet Union. The partisans are getting angrier. They're getting, you know, they have consensus, even if they, if they lost the elections. Maybe they'll win the next one. So we have to, to stop them from taking control of Italy. It just shot Togliatti. Hmm? He was just shot Togliatti uh, to this reason. That was another man- moment of tensions because protests started overall in Italy. There were riots and only on the, on the day of the at- assassination attempt, 14 people were killed in riots. There were deaths in Genoa, in Naples, Livorno, Taranto, so these big cities, north and south actually. Um, even smaller, smaller ones like La Spezia, uh, also in Rome, but extend. In the following days, uh, I forgot to mention, there were all those, uh, again, 600 people were wounded and 16 more that uh, died during the riots. Uh, that, that was probably the highest you know, point of this kind of tension in Italy. Togliatti would eventually survive, but within hours of the assassination attempt, the Italian working class responded with a nationwide wildcat general strike affecting factories, offices, shops and public transport. In Venice, workers invaded the radio studios of the national public broadcaster. In Arezzo, a jail was attacked and its prisoners freed. In the tiny town of Abadia San Salvatore, a full-scale uprising broke out in which two police officers were killed. But, as with the liberation from fascism a few years earlier, the strongest reactions came from northern Italy's industrial hubs. In Milan, a mass meeting of 40,000 workers decided to occupy their factories. Meanwhile, in Genoa, 50,000 people occupied the city centre. When a patrol of five armoured cars was sent to stop them, the crowd quickly took possession of the vehicles, just like many of them would have done during the war against Nazi or fascist soldiers. However, just like with the smaller partisan rebellions, the leadership of the left-wing parties and unions ultimately moved to bring this revolt to an end. To become a bit more quiet was that when the main socialist and communist, um, the, the highest members of the Social and Communist Party just say, start to saying, you know what, no, just calm down. It's not worthy. And then even Toyat himself was from his uh, hospital bed say, you know what, calm down. It, 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 it's not worthy. It was nothing. This guy was, you know, just a bit crazy and he didn't know what he did and uh, etc. Things, uh, tension was anyway rising. Uh, they, they were even kidnapped the Fiat uh, leader, you know. Uh, they kept him for a whole day before freeing him. Uh, but again, it's, since the will of the of uh, Togliatti and Nenni was the secretary of the Socialist Party, said, you know, just stop, don't do anything stupid. That was when things uh, just broke down. Without winning any concessions, Communist Party and union leaders called on their members to return to work. When workers in Milan heard this, thousands marched on their union headquarters to demand an explanation. But when they arrived, the building was surrounded by police who refused to let them in while their union and party leaders refused to speak to them. Despite all the Cold War sloganeering about a communist party preparing to seize power, the Togliatti amnesty and the party's swift movement against partisan revolts showed that its leaders were not interested in organising militant struggle, let alone revolution. 
While factory committees had played an important role in liberation from Nazi occupation, after the war, communist leaders dissolved them. As according to party historian Gaston Manacorta, they feared the committees would, quote, expropriate the capitalists and establish cooperative management of the works, end quote. As Togliatti himself said, rather than class struggle in Italy's fields and factories, the aim was to participate in Italy's post-war recovery on the basis of, quote, low cost of production, a high productivity of labour, and high wages, end quote. 1948, then, can be thought of as the final defeat of the resistance generation. Demobilised by party and union leaders, the 1950s would be a difficult decade, not least in anti-worker violence from the Italian state. Between 1948 and 1954, around 75 workers were killed and over 5,000 wounded as a result of police action against protests. And, as a cruel irony of history, many of the police chiefs ordering the attacks would have started their careers during the fascist dictatorship, while many of the workers killed or wounded were former anti-fascist partisans. While the resistance generation was largely defeated, the popular memory of the resistance remained and things would explode again in 1960, when the Christian Democrats turned to the far-right MSI to form a government. In 1960, where this government, ruled by, from the Tambroni, which was part, of course, of the Democrazia Cristiana, he was the fiducia, I mean, the, he obtained the, the vote of the fiducia, so the, it's the final vote that the Italian law grants, you know, the, a party to rule, I mean, the, the majority to rule. Uh, it, it got the fiducia of the MSI. So actually, there was a government in Italy which was elected with the vote of fascists. There was too much. There was already, you know, above the line. And what made things worse is that the the MSA decided to hold his congresso, his congress, in Genoa, which was a city that suffered heavily during the war. In Genoa, at the point, you had the Nazis who just massed, you know, the workers from factories who did the strikes and just send them back to Germany, and few of them came back. There were huge fightings, the resistance in Liguria was quite active, and as I say, repression following the resistance was hideous, it was horrible. Furthermore, the, the Congress was to be physically, you know, take place just a few hundred meters from the Sacrario dei Partigiani, from the monument that was dedicated to the partisans. And there was too much. Uh, the point is that was too much, not mainly for the parties, for the anti-fascist parties, because the, most of, apart from the MSC, they were all anti-fascist parties. But was uh, mostly the, the the those who you know get uh, get angry more about that was youth. Uh, people who were just children during the war, or even born after that, they were also former partisans. Uh, but the point is that they start to you know getting into the street and, and protesting uh, spontaneously without, at first, the end of the Communist Party. Another thing that got you know, the Genoese people angry was the presence of Carlo Emanuele Basile, which was the head of the provincia of Genoa during the war, and it was one of the people responsible to you know, track down and send these workers into Germany. And Genoa, was, it was too much for Genoa, and so after they saw that, uh, the people started to went to the street in June, and the Congress was to be taken uh, at the beginning of July, the 2nd of July, in Genoa, was supposed to start. Uh, and there were huge uh, fightings on the 30th of June in uh, Piazza de Ferraris. After that, they just decided to, you know, uh, to renounce, to hold the, the Congress in Genoa. This was a huge victory, uh, but it was not only about Genoa. The protests spread all across Italy, uh, not only, uh, we do not only have protests by anti-fascists, we also have some, uh, you know, terrorist attacks by fascists who shot at Casa del Popolo, who shot at Union um, offices, this kind of stuff. Uh, the one that, that is worth mentioning is the Stragi di Reggio Emilia. In Reggio Emilia, so again, Emilia, Emilia Romagna, uh, there was this huge rally r rally against, you know, what was happening in Genoa. It was even after it was cancelled, um, where just policemen, they just opened fire and they killed five people. Two of them, they were young people. Three of them, they were former partisans who were killed by the police of that state was supposed to be born 
on the experience of their assistance in Italy. The riots, which became known as the Fatti di Genova, would have implications far beyond Genoa itself and pointed towards a new way of doing radical politics. This was a marking point for the left, was saying, you know what, maybe the Communist Party is not really doing its best to obtain a revolution, to, to conquer, you know, these kind of rights. So we can, there are many people who say that the 1960 was also the beginning of everything that was left of the Communist Party, which was almost nothing till then. There were a few, you know, almost invisible groups left of the Communist Party. Now, now, now there was something more. And then we know we have all that experience that goes through the 60s and 70s and part of the 80s. It marks the, um, probably the, the distance, the growing distance between the Communist Party and its people, let's say, between commas, and say that, yeah, probably th that's not the best we can have. And, and we, which, you know, opens the way to a different way to, of doing uh, communist politics, legal or not legal armed and unarmed. That is what I think uh, we can say about the Fatih Genoa. Indeed, the driving force for the Fatih di Genova were young people outside any traditional organisations. They were dubbed the guys in the striped shirts for the fashionable horizontally striped shirts that many of them were wearing. Their actions, which were beyond Communist Party control, were a sign that a new generation of activists, with a new way of doing radical politics, was fast approaching. But we'll have to wait until our series on the Italian struggles of the 60s and 70s to tell that story. Of course, the power that the resistance had for popular social movements meant that its memory would have to be attacked and distorted in various ways. One distortion was how fascism itself would come to be understood as a part, or rather not, of Italian history. After fascism was defeated, it was important how history, you know, how Italian history will have to be written considering of what, on what happened especially during the war, but throughout the whole fascist ventennio. So uh, what happens then, it's, it, it's incredible, because like the epic you know, uh, of Italian history that starts from the mid-19th century, when Italy was formed, you know, and the Risorgimento, their, fought, their fight against the invaders. So it's a, this glorious history that goes on and you know, goes on with the so-called Fourth War of Independence, which is the Great War, actually, that is part of the of the of the really epic and what have to be we have to be proud about that national history, you know. And then we have uh, those two three years of uh, liberal post war liberal Italy, and then we have fascism, and fascism is uh, is considered as a mistake, as an exception, you know. It's like mushroom that just came out from the from from beneath the ground and say they were so evil they took power. Uh, because they were so evil and violent, and they just, you know, beat their way to the government. Now, there's a there's a problem with this reading, as you can understand. Uh, there's a big, there's something missing, a huge thing missing. It is the role of the industrial and agrarian economic powers of Italy, the, 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 those the people, the, the the support they gave to fascism, the role they they, they granted them to say. You here, you're a bunch of, you know, violent thugs. Now you work for us. Now you go beat the crap out of uh, socialists and communist workers. You put them back in line. We give you money. We give you political support. And you just, I, we don't want to end up like in Russia. So this is what, how fascism moved from being a small group of uh, violent fanatics uh, to a ruling party. It was not just because they were viol only violent and, I don't know, like evil. It was because they granted that power. This view of fascism is actually quite common, not just in Italy, but in much of the world. The whole phenomenon is reduced to just a temporary mania, perhaps in response to recent events like the Great Depression, but mostly just a historical aberration. In this view, there are no implications about the class society that supported fascism for so long nor is there any need to reflect about its relevance to the present day. With fascism reduced to this temporary mania interrupting the national story, the memory of the resistance has similarly been reduced to fit a narrative that the partisans were only interested in getting rid of fascism. If I go out now in Italy and ask people, a resistance were those fighting against an invader, it was not like that. 
most of the partisans, except maybe from the Badogliani, they imagined an outcome that would have changed not only the political system, but even the social system that ruled Italy, not only since 1922, but even the years before, even with Giolitti and the previous uh, and the liberal Italy of the years uh, before, the Italy of the Great War and so on. So they wanted change. They wanted something different. And this is not just an hypothesis. You can see that in the way the resistance divisions were organized. The Badogliani, they were an army. They were an army. There was the officer, and you just go down and make the, you know, the salute to the officer, and you have your hierarchy, and the, you know, the officer, they're just in the, in the back and give order, and you do that, and you attack and that. The other, most of the other formations, most of the other divisions, they were horizontally organized. There was a, a chief, but the chief was the one who usually was on the front line fighting with the soldiers. There was a gender question. There were a lot of female partisans, even fighting ones. Nowadays, we only talk about the staffette, which were like um, the, those women who were just carrying messages from one point to another. There were a lot of fighting women as well. They, they were killed and they fought and they bleed for the resistance. Alongside this rewriting of what the resistance were fighting for, future rewrites of history would find different ways to diminish what the resistance actually did. The way they just try, you know, to reduce the role of the resistance in the, you know, an anticipation of Republican Italy is what opened a huge uh, side, you know, of history, of the, of the history of the resistance to the attack of post-fascist groups. This um, went on for decades hmm? after the end of the war. There was a point where things, you know, moved to an higher level, especially beginning of the 90s, because the fall of communists and the fall of the Communist Party and the Svolta di Fuggi, which is this, this event where the former fascists say, you know, we're not fascists anymore, we're liberals, in theory. There was this guy who was from the PDS, who was the head of the Communist Party, so he was a leftist, uh, Luciano Violante, uh, who once said, he was the first one to do that, a leftist, and say, yeah, you know what? Yeah, partisans, they were, they were heroes. But the, the, the youth who, fight, who fought for the Repubblica Sociale, in the end, they had their own you know, beliefs and they, they were just guys and kids and, and youth of, as the other one. He was the first one saying that. But next to that, next to this institutional level, there was this, um, yeah, there was, there was this huge work which was done by historiography, like Panza, uh, which was one of the first who took those episodes that we mentioned before where, where fascists were killed, um, they just they took these episodes, they make them bigger. Here, Davide is referring to the work of Giampaolo Panza, one of the most famous writers of revisionist histories about the resistance. In his Blood of the Vanquished series, Panza argues that anti-fascist violence during the war was as bad as that committed by the Nazis and fascists themselves, and a prelude to an attempt to seize power by the Communist Party. His works operate through a process of decontextualization and omission. A glaring example of this is actually on the front cover of Blood of the Vanquished itself. On it, partisans are marching a man through the streets, the caption on the inside cover explaining, quote, fascist killed on April 28th, 1945, end quote. But the man in question was not just any fascist, but Carlo Barzaghi, the executioner of Verziere, responsible for compiling lists of Jews and political opponents for deportation to concentration camps and implicated in the murder of the 15 partisans we mentioned in part 2, whose dead bodies were left on display in Milan's Piazzale Loreto. So, before we've even reached page 1 of Panzer's book, sleight of hand is used to present the reader with what looks like an unlucky victim of excessive anti-fascist violence, when what we're actually seeing is in fact a documented war criminal. As the historian Claudio Vercelli explains, quote, it is useless to try and read something methodologically based or attributable to the category of historical studies in Panza, end quote. And that Panza's characterization of the Communist Party, quote, borders on caricature and is borrowed from the frameworks and underlying paradigms of neo-fascist journalism, end quote. Panza books are amazing because they have no sources, except from like witness from other fascists. So it's like, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're a monologue, basically. They just you say, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm right. 
and they keep doing that, like taking these episodes, making them big up, taking history of uh, you know young girls being raped by partisans, which are nowhere to be found in any archive in any stuff. But they do, and they have you have this you know network that make the, these things popular. So nowadays we we move from um, from a scenario where if in the worst case scenario the resistance was useless because they say you know what yeah but. Uh, it's the Allies who did all the job. It's the American. It's the, the British. They did all the job. Really, partisans were not influential. They shot some passes sometimes. That's all. That that's not true. Uh, even you know German officials in Italy said they're a pain in the ass. They're making damages. They're difficult to fight, especially if we're fighting the Allies at the same time. But for years, you have this kind of point of view says, no, it's, it's the Allies who won the war. The Resistance, they, they did nothing. Now we switch to another kind of uh, idea where actually they were criminals. They just did nothing. Not only they were not useful in winning the war, but they just did heinous crimes. They raped, they killed, they massacred, they butchered people. Millions of Italians were killed by the partisans after that, which is not true, of course. But they managed to do that due to this continuously you know historical work this historical work actually goes far beyond that of revisionist historians in recent years films and tv shows have been made which put forward exactly this kind of historical narrative for instance in 2005 italy's national public broadcaster produced and aired il cuore nel pozzo a two-part mini-series which presents a grossly unfair picture of yugoslav partisans indiscriminately persecuting the entire italian population the show won the approval of the far-right National Alliance, which was a rebranding of the previous post-war fascist party, the MSI. Elsa Pellizzari pointed out to us in our interview that, at the time, the National Alliance was actually part of Silvio Berlusconi's right-wing government. When Berlusconi went to lead the country to become Prime Minister, he legitimised the National Alliance. He became Prime Minister with the votes of the fascists because the National Alliance was a fascist party. He legitimised them to get their votes and we have seen what the end of all that was. However, the revisionism of Il Cuore nel Pozzo would be outdone by the 2018 film Redland, Rosso Istria. As historian Eric Gobetti explains, where the victims in Il Cuore nel Pozzo are innocent Italians struck by bloodthirsty partisans, in Redland, the film's heroes and victims are unequivocally fascists, whose only salvation are the Nazi soldiers. Unsurprisingly, this film also earned the praise of the far-right Brothers of Italy party, yet another rebrand from the National Alliance that we just mentioned. Since then, the Brothers of Italy have formed the government as the biggest party in a right-wing coalition. Attacks on migrants, the LGBT community and the left have followed, as have attacks on the memory of the resistance. In March 2023, President of the Senate Ignazio La Russa called the partisan attack at Via Rasella, which we covered in part two, anything but noble, claiming that the Nazi SS troops that partisans attacked were actually a musical band of semi-pensioners. When we spoke to Elsa just a few months before she passed away, the Brothers of Italy weren't in power yet, but she had some thoughts about the fascist threat today. We have to stay very, very, very alert because the fascists want to come to power. They still want to be in charge. For 50 years, I have gone into schools to talk to kids. But the kids, the youngest, even those in university, don't know certain things. They can't even imagine them either. So much that I've had meetings for hours and hours, they have endless questions because they didn't know anything they want to know. Unfortunately, no one knows the history, the real one. You are the generation that has to rebuild the foundations. I told you, youngsters, you are the pillars. You have to carry forward that anti-fascist spirit that has animated us for all of our lives. That's it for our four-part series on the Italian resistance. If you want to know about some films about Italian fascism and the resistance that are actually good, you should check out our bonus episode where we talk about some of our favourites. We also have bonus episodes where we discuss our favourite songs that came out of the resistance 
as well as post-war anti-fascism and how Italian fascism survived to produce the party that currently governs Italy. All of this is available exclusively for our supporters on Patreon. It is only support from you, our listeners, which allows us to make these podcasts. So if you appreciate our work, please do think about joining us at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory, link in the show notes. In return for your support, you get early access to episodes, ad-free episodes, as well as exclusive bonus content, discounted merch, and more. And if you can't spare the cash, that's absolutely no problem. Please just tell your friends about this podcast and give us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. If you'd like to learn more about the Italian resistance to fascism, check out the webpage for this episode where you'll find images, a full list of sources, further reading and more. Link in the show notes. We also want to thank Carlo Gianuzzi from the Commissione Scuola and Brescia and Davide from Cronica Ribelli for all their invaluable help producing this series. We'd also like to thank the National Association of Italian Partisans for letting us use interviews from their amazing Noi Partigiani website which contains over 650 interviews with participants in the Italian resistance. Links to all of these in the show notes. We'd also like to thank Lillian McCarthy and Davide for their translations and to our amazing voice actors, Susie, Carlo Gianuzzi, Chiara, Carlo, Giacomo and Ampi Londra. Thanks also to our Patreon supporters for making this podcast possible. Special thanks to Jameson D. Saltzman, Jazz Hands and Fernanda Lopez Ojeda. Our theme tune is Bella Ciao. Thanks for permission to use it from Dischi del Sole. You can buy it or stream it on the links in the show notes. This episode was edited by Tyler Hill. Anyway, that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed the episode and thanks for listening.